Hello everyone, I'm James Milan. Welcome to this episode of Talk of the Town. And uh, I'll tell you, for this episode, color me impressed with this guy who's sitting right next to me at the table. Uh, Derek Mola was a, uh, a briefly an intern here back in the spring of 2020s. Maybe that rings some bells for you guys. Uh, certainly in terms of Derek's uh, experience here, it got cut short. Fortunately, he has been doing plenty of productive stuff in his time ever since then, including graduating from college, of course. Um, but why am I impressed? Well, specifically, the last time we saw Derek was earlier this year. We are currently in the fall of 2024. Uh, we saw him in January of 2024 when he published his, by himself his first book, Anansi's Web, which... Uh, we were happy to talk about both the process, the book itself, et cetera, and it was a great conversation. Well, lo and behold, less than 10 months later, 10 full months later, we are back to talk about Derek's second book, The Lavender Fields. Uh, amazing to me, you know, just to write two books in a lifetime is pretty good. To write them both in a year, wow. Uh, so with, with that, let me welcome you. Thank you. I'm so happy to be back for yeah. the second time. I love coming back here. As, as much as I can. It's mm -hmm. great. Well, uh, you just keep writing. <laughs> we'll yeah, we'll yeah. keep talking right. to you. Um, so, yeah, on that, uh, on that, I'd actually like to start. Obviously, we want to spend most of our time talking about lavender fields, et cetera. But let me actually connect this back to our first conversation about Anansi's Web. And, you know, a lot of what we talked about at that time was both the creative process itself um, and then this, this much less glamorous piece or romantic piece of actually getting it done and dealing with all the people you have to deal with and the things you have to deal with to publish a book. So now you've, that's uh, you know, a number of months behind you and you're kind of embarking on the whole process again with your mm -hmm. new book. But tell me what takeaways you have from, you know, as you look back on you know, our first interview and what's happened since then, just share with us, you know, how, how this has been for you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been obviously exciting. It's been really great. Yeah, it was so many months ago that we talked about the first book. Uh, it's been going well since then. Um, you know, it's, it's, it was the first step in a long journey. So it didn't sell as many as I had, as I had hoped for. Um, but I also expected that because first time author, indie author, what can you do? Mm -hmm, no one, no mm -hmm. one knows who you are. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I think it made some impressions. I think I got a lot of great reviews. I think overall, the people who did read it really liked it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, and I was really happy with it overall. I got just so many compliments from people uh, that really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not complaining about anything I'm, I'm so happy with it and all of that experience was definitely taken into the second one for sure mm -hmm. and you know let's just remind folks what Anansi's web was about because you're still you're, you're working in the same general space I would say with lavender fields but t tell just remind folks what Anansi's web and yeah. maybe a few more people will be like, oh, yeah, that sounds interesting. Yeah, I hope, let's, yeah, let's, let's absolutely. Let's go look for that. Um, yeah, Nancy's Web was my first book. It was a collection of short, dark fantasy stories. It had, like, bits of folklore and mythology, um, different creatures and characters from all around the world. Anansi uh, is the god of stories in African folklore. And uh, in the book, a young boy named Kwaku goes to talk with Anansi. He hasn't heard any good stories in a long time. Anansi tells him... 10 new stories, and those are the stories that I wrote in there. There's stories in Africa, in the Middle East, and in China, mm -hmm. and Australia, Europe. It's kind of all, I wanted to encompass all over the, the world as, as much as I could, as, uh, as much as I could Not too out. ambitious. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and it was, and yeah, the second one, I wanted to do another short story collection. I, uh, I love short stories, and this one is more horror and, and sci-fi mm -hmm. then which you had mentioned i remember in our first conversation was something yes. that you are drawn to as a genre mm -hmm. um and and clearly uh you've got your models for that i'm sure but you mm -hmm. also have your own experience now that you've been writing stories really for quite a while yeah i know that you're you started writing stories back in high school or before is that right yeah i uh i got interested 
in high school, junior year of high school. Before then, I was not a reader at all. Like, I read what I had to read in school, but mm -hmm. I, I just did not like to read, and I, I didn't like to write. It wasn't until junior year of high school where my teacher started showing us books that I really liked. Like, uh, we read uh, Illustrated Man by Ray Bradbury. Mm -hmm. It was a big inspiration for me. And that was the first book where I was like, oh, no, reading is great. And there's like, you just, I, was just, I just wasn't reading the right books. I right, just wasn't reading right. the things that I was interested in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I, you know, back in high school, I loved uh, Catcher in the Rye and uh, Perks of Being a Wallflower. These, they really connected. I don't really care for them much now, but back mm -hmm. then they really, right, they spoke to they you really connected moment. with me as a, yeah, as yeah. a young teenager. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to write like that at first. And uh, when I got to college, went to film school, came here, I went in a completely different direction. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the pandemic when everything was closed down and the film industry was kind of barren you know mm -hmm. just everything everything was right shut down. everything was shut down you got to figure out what yeah, you're going to do the, for yourself it wasn't the industry's fault just yeah, it was yeah. shut down mm -hmm. and uh decided well let me go back to the, doing that short story writing that i left all those years ago and i started reading again i was like well if i'm going to do that i need to read a book <laughs> i need to read some books and uh and i just fell back in love with it i was like right. oh no this is and i was just getting officially into horror and fantasy and something I had never really been interested in. I was so interesting. Really interested yeah, in it's it. interesting because a lot of people I know, um, including my own children, uh, you know, really got quite deeply into some of these fantasy authors and series when they mm -hmm. were young children. But for you, that really didn't happen at that time. It took, uh, it took until you were more your adult self yeah. and deciding what it is that you want to read and what excites you that that, that you know, discovered that. A late bloomer, as, <laughs> as I like to say. I was, I was a really late bloomer. And uh, it was also comic books, too, that really helped shape my interest and got me into reading as well. I work, I work in a comic book store now, and I worked in a comic book store back then as well. And mm -hmm. that was sort of my catalyst for reading. It's just you, you read these comics, you know, things like... Um, Hellboy or, or uh, the Sandman series mm -hmm. or Junji Ito, mm -hmm. who's a horror manga artist. And then you you start looking for those things that they were inspired by or the, the mythology in the books that they were mm -hmm. into. And then that just leads you down a, a rabbit hole of, of reading. You just start reading more and more and more. And so... I owe a lot to comic books as well for, for yeah, yeah. shaping my... I'd for actually... setting my catalyst. Yeah, I, yeah I would li I'd like to... like pursue that a little bit more yeah. uh, today. So um, you've, you've got two books. Tell me what the influence, uh, uh, you know, both in content, in style, in imagination, et cetera, what, what is that connection that, yeah. you, that you can speak to uh, between comic books and what you're doing? Yeah, so I would say one of the big influences was H.P. Lovecraft, um, kind of a controversial person, mm -hmm. but uh, he wrote amazing stories and sort of he's the not sort of he is the the father of of cosmic horror mm -hmm. which is sort of the the fear of the universe the fear of of what's out there and sort of the insignificantness of of humanity and that permeates throughout the book uh sort of our our insignificance as as human beings mm -hmm. um and then Obviously, Ray Bradbury, just an amazing science fiction writer, you know, horror and uh, horror, horror slash science fiction writer. He mm -hmm. was absolutely amazing. Uh, for comic books, uh, I mean, Hellboy has always been a huge influence on me. Uh, there's not really much fantasy in, in this book. For the last one, absolutely, it mm -hmm. was really huge. But those... Uh, there's a lot of short stories in Hellboy. There's a lot of like out of context, mm -hmm. just self-contained short stories. And those really influenced my short story writing. Mm -hmm. I just loved how they were, how they were paced. And, and again, it, so they sort of dealt with that in insignificance a little bit mm -hmm. as well. It was just this character that was really out of place and all of these different things were going on. And it was, he was just trying to figure out how to deal with that. And oftentimes the, 
the magical creatures also didn't know what was going on. We, I, I, I often you find in folklore and mythology that uh, these characters seem to know more, like these creatures, these gods, whatever mm -hmm. demigods. They seem to like know more. They have this big knowledge. What I liked in the Hellboy books was that they also seemed like they didn't know. <laughs> like what, they were in the they, dark. They, as well. they didn't know what was going on, and I, I mm. and I loved that. And that mm -hmm. sort of that's in the last in Anansi's web as well, and also kind of permeates through this as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I'm realizing in, in listening to you also is like you have a whole uh, visual uh, part of your aesthetic. Uh, clearly, you went to film school. You love comic books. You've been mm -hmm. steeped in that for a long time. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about how that you know finds its way, filters its way into into your literature. Uh, between like all the different. Uh yeah, just uh, the visual, the visual elements that yeah. that in these in these other areas that you're interested in and have been, and have explored. Yeah. But now you're writing words, right? You're, yeah. You're trying to do. There are there are some paintings, lovely, uh, in here. Yes. Some artwork uh, that really uh, support the the stories as well. But but for you, I mean, you didn't supply that. And, yeah. Um, yeah, so you're dealing with words, yeah, right? As a as a non-reader from a long time ago, <laughs> right. yeah. um, so but I can't imagine that you just put this visual stuff aside. No, um, yeah, I I uh, I would I often think back to my time in film and trying to screenwrite, and I I often realize that uh, I I just like I needed more words when I was because with screenwriting it's very it's very different. You don't use that many words mm -hmm. when you screenwrite. Right. You just it's sort of the dialogue and there's brief descriptions you make of notes, right, brief little... descriptions of like what the scenes are. Mm -hmm. There's not really room. It depends on the screenwriter, but there's for a typical screenwriter, there's not much room for flowery language mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. description because all that comes later. All of that your your job as the screenwriter is to write the blue it's a blueprint. You're mm -hmm. writing a you're drawing a blueprint of a house. And then you hand that off to the the, dire to right, the, the director and the director, actors, right? And they, they they do all of that later. You give suggest like you know you're you're the you have your vision as the screenwriter, but all of that comes mm -hmm. later. The director might make changes or they might spruce things up. Who knows? Right. Um, so, but it's I definitely a, a combination vision. Yes. Basically, right. And I I don't want to say I was a bad screenwriter, but I definitely. I needed more words, and the the more I wrote, the more I realized that like this vision in my head of things that I wanted, I couldn't, I, my brain just couldn't comprehend putting it all in screenplay screen format. Screen and format. With, I needed, I needed more words. But that vision is there. The, you know, when I went, you know, film school really taught me to think in visual. You have to. You have to think in visuals. It's a, you're doing a camera and you're mm -hmm. pointing it at, at a thing, um, and it teach you have to think it teaches you to think just in visuals so often when i'm writing i do have those visuals in my head and it really just comes down to me finding the... to me describing it and mm -hmm. writing it down mm -hmm. um and it's the same with comic books too i mean comic books are are really just glorified storyboards mm -hmm. right i mean i don't want to say that's kind of putting the right, right, right. that's that, putting the medium down in a right, way right that's more glib than you want to be yeah, about but, it i got you but but it's you know this vis this uh, visual format that really, when done well, can move like a screenplay or like a movie. You know, just moving from panel to panel, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. it's wonderful. And get re again, in comic books, you have to think in visuals because it's you're drawing the That's visual. Right. So, in my and I've and I've written, tried to write comic scripts before, and I've I've tried to study it a little bit. And again, it's sort of that like it teaches you to th think and write in visuals of like how. This visual in my head for a comic book, right? It's like, how am I going to describe that to the artist? You have to describe it for the artist so they can draw mm -hmm, it down. Mm -hmm. um, so that was that's been tremendous help as well. Really, like thinking in visuals and learning to and then figuring out how learning to, how to describe that. Is, right, filter is, that through language. Yeah, yeah which huge. I bet is a big part. Again, lavender fields is what we are now going to be talking about. Yes. In fact. Um, and what brought you back in here. So let's start with the fact that this is the cover. Um, yes. And it's a beautiful, it's very engaging. Yeah. Um, it's it's a beautiful shades of lavender, uh, obviously, against a, a really dark background, which takes which makes me think right away of 
kind of interstellar, interplanetary, yeah. out in space kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So give you know, give us an introduction to the Lavender Fields, please. Yeah, uh, the Lavender Fields is another collection of short stories, short horror sci-fi stories. Um, in the book, there is an astronaut. They get trapped in the tenth dimension during a mission, and in the tenth dimension is every conceivable universe, every every alternate universe. And the only way he can humanly comprehend it and describe it is that of a lavender field. And every lavender plant and stalk is a, a different person in a different universe, different life. And he sees all of the, the life. And when, you know, when the person dies, the plant wilts. And, uh, and so in the book, he is, there's some diary entries of the astronaut himself describing, or their self describing their time there just mm -hmm. trapped there and then the stories themselves are the different people in different universes mm -hmm. and they're very sci they're sci-fi horror there's some elements of you know lovecrafty and there's some uh, some body horror some like existential horrors lots of uh try to keep it as varied as possible mm -hmm. yeah um and the uh the idea so I'm, I'm thinking it's really interesting in some ways that, you know, we talked just when we were talking about Anansi's Web and you were saying that you really wanted to kind of span the globe for those stories. And I was saying, oh, that's pretty ambitious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. These are small books. Yeah. But I you know, got I some know. big ambitions because you've now taken us way beyond the globe yeah. and uh, out into, you know, the center of the universe, so to speak, or the universes. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, again, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that all of that is encompassed in, you know, a specific genre, this, this combination of horror and, and sci-fi. Uh, and then in a, in a, in a bite-sized book, in yeah. a sense. Um, but it's a really interesting combination of, you know the scope of what it is that you're looking at, mm -hmm. uh, and and then the format in which you're you're choosing to present that. Yeah, I um, <laughs> I ha I have ADD. I have ADHD, and uh, I have a very short attention span. Most young people have a short attention span now, <laughs> so it's uh, any way to get it in as bite size and as quick as possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and I I love a I love a long book. I I, I enjoy a long book, but there are, but I you know. There are also plenty of times where I just love a, a short book. Mm -hmm. It feels great when you read a short book because you're just, it's like, well, oh, I, I finished it. I feel, you know, I, I, I finished a book and short stories, I get the same kind of thing because in a book you're getting multiple stories. Mm -hmm. So you just, you know, you, even when you finish one right, in the right. collection, there's you're a like, sense of accomplishment. I have a sense there's of accomplishment. Sense of, yeah, I did yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I don't like, and, and I'm also, I think this goes back to the, the filmmaking a little bit where I like to, I try to cut the fat as much as possible. Um, you learn that when you're screenwriting. Again, you don't need a ton of description. You don't need certain things. Mm -hmm. So I think with me, I try to keep it as simple as possible. I don't try to add more than necessary. I don't, uh, I don't try to over explain. I try to keep it as simple as possible and cut out mm -hmm. what needs there to be. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why it ends up, they end up being short because I, I try to get the story out as effectively mm -hmm. and as quickly as possible mm -hmm. without it being forced or right. with bad, right, you know, bad writing or anything like that. <laughs> right, you <know>? right, right, <laughs> right. You get the, you, you set the, the you know, you, you got your baseline, which is good writing. Yeah. Um, but then from there, you have a lot of choices to make. And, and in your case, what you're saying is you're looking more in the, Raymond Carver version of, of short stories. I don't know if you're familiar with Raymond Carver, but famously uh, economical uh, yeah. with with his words. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, there's much to be said for that. Interesting again, also that you uh, you know you reminded us that you didn't enjoy reading as a as a smaller ch as a younger child. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and again, you're growing up in a world in which everything comes at you pretty fast yeah. and in bite-sized chunks, as we all know. Mm -hmm. um, and so this also seems to fit into that. But again, I love the idea that it's combined with what is a pretty expansive, yeah. um, I don't know if you want if I want to call it ambition, but vision. Yeah. Your vision is quite expansive. Thank you. Yeah. Um, less, less is more and you get a lot in a, in a, quick size bite, you mm -hmm, know? And mm -hmm. I think 
I think the goal is just to get people to read, you know, and, and if that means the books need to be shorter or, or, in a, or you know, less than 200 pages or mm -hmm. less than whatever, 300 pages, whatever it is, it, it doesn't matter. I, people, you want people to read. You, I, I, you know, I was such an anti, you know, I was such an anti-reader for so long just mm -hmm. as, a, as a kid and, you know, you just think reading is dumb mm -hmm. you know, and, and then I'm, it's all I do every, like I, I, I'm reading like every single day. It's, it's my biggest hobby. It's all I do. And it's been such a uh -huh. huge thing in my life. So it, you know, anything to get people to read, mm -hmm. you just want people to read. You want them to think critically and expand their minds. So that's great. Yeah. Um, so much expansion of mind possible uh, through, <laughs> through, through the reading of the Lavender Fields and Nazi's Web and other, and other things, Lovecraft, etc. Definitely, we've been talking about both the aesthetics and the and the kind of ideas underlying this, and so that's all somewhat ephemeral. I'm going to bring it right down to the concrete here, sure. and ask you talk talk to us again about what the challenges are that you have found here in the practical real world yes. of getting a second book out, and again in such a short period of time. Yeah, so first book was published in January, uh, six months went by uh, in between that I was started working on this I'd started writing some of the like the diary entries mm -hmm. and then in June I got invited to the uh, Merrimack Valley Halloween Book Festival which just happened on the 19th uh, just this past October just the, yeah 19th. just this past mm -hmm. 19th yeah and that was a lot of fun it was really great and I decided that I'm going to try to finish the Lavender Fields by the 19th. Mm. Like, That's going to be my deadline. Wow. I'm going to try so to... So June to October. Yeah. I was like, oh, I'm just going to... A whopping four months you gave yourself. Yeah. I was like, I'm just, I'm just going to try to bang these out, write these out. I knew, for the most part, what the stories were about. And I figured it'd be a fun challenge. Be like, let's see if I can get this done, have a second book done in a year. And so for that, I just worked my butt off for four months, uh, just writing these stories, and then when they were and all... And was that useful to have a deadline in terms of it that? Was would interesting. you do that again in yes. the future? Yes, yes, I would. It was, uh, it was a challenge. It was my first time with something creative where it was a hard deadline. Mm -hmm. I guess I shouldn't say hard because I didn't pose it on myself there wasn't any repercussions if I mm -hmm. didn't but I really wanted to but it was it was other than I would have felt a I guess sense of shame is too hard of a word but right but, right. Like, but you would have been disappointed yes if you yeah I wanted to yet. yes I wanted to have it done by that day and so if I worked for four months I, I worked with an editor I worked with my cover artist and my interior designer and we got it all done and I figured that it would be done in time, but one of the hiccups that I ran into was uh, there were a lot of last minute issues that came up in the manuscript. There were a lot of uh, last minute spelling mistakes and, and mm. grammar mistakes and, and some formatting mistakes. And so those had to be corrected and there were errors like I said, in the formatting itself, things needed to be changed around. And so when the 19th came, I wasn't able to have physical copies for mm -hmm. the event. I had like a QR code that people could scan and I had prints of the artwork that were in the book that I was giving, handing out to people if anybody bought one. And I had some people buy it, but not as many as I had thought mm -hmm. and I and probably know, not as many as if you'd had actual copies yeah of and I to be able to take with them I had my first book there too and I sold more copies of the mm -hmm. first book than that mm -hmm. and I think obviously people came to the event wanting to buy physical mm -hmm. copies mm -hmm. there were other vendors there selling their physical books mm -hmm. I don't think people really wanted to be fair not complaining yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah, this yeah. I'm fair I don't I don't think I would have done the same thing it's you know it's, it's asking a lot of someone to like pull out their phone, scan the codes, go yeah, through and Amazon. Follow up later. And follow, follow, yeah. it's, it's hard. So yeah. I totally instead of just buying the book right then and there. Yep, for sure. So that was that was a challenge. So lesson um, learned there. Lesson um, learned there. Um, I had issues with with Amazon themselves with uh, publishing through 
KDP through Amazon KDP. Uh, what is KDP? Is uh, Kindle Direct Publishing is uh, yeah uh, yeah Kindle Direct Publishing. That's just that's their that's their kind of independent publishing. Yeah yeah that's their firm. their service where you can put everything on there. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize that they won't let you order copies five days before your actual release. Mm. So if anybody is planning to do that, just be wary. That is a thing. Mm -hmm. um, I had. There were some issues where uh, Barnes and Noble was trying to order copies, and uh, they Amazon was giving them a hard time with ordering it. So I don't know what to do about that. Mm. That I think that's just something I have to be aware of mm -hmm. next time, and yeah. just keep that in mind. And with the having a deadline, so well maybe Amazon will go out of business and just be replaced. <laughs> yeah, by yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> and no shade against Amazon. They're, right. I mean, they're doing what they're. I just I just wasn't aware of these things, mm -hmm. so I mm -hmm. had so lesson learned about that, and it was just hard meeting. I guess just overall, it was just hard meeting a deadline, and I'm I think next time I'll just be better prepared. Of this is how long these things will take, right? And I need to not only double check but triple, quadruple check the manuscript before mm -hmm. I start formatting it. And give it. yourself enough time to be able to, yes. to, to do that. Right, so these are the things that we all learn when we, yeah. when, we take, when, when we take anything on for the first time and then we can apply it after that. So that, that's good as far as it goes. Um, I'm wondering, you're going to have another chance, I assume, to put all this into practice because you're still yeah. writing, right? Yes. So what's, what's the next thing? Well, I really want to do a full novel. That's the that's the next thing, mm -hmm. um, because I love writing short stories and I and I love I still love reading short stories, but I really want that to be the next challenge. You mm -hmm. always want to challenge yourself, mm -hmm. and I think writing a a full novel is the next mm -hmm. step. And so, and do you already have the idea for it in your in your mind or? Yes, uh, I'll say you don't have to you don't have to tell us anything. If you I'll say it's uh, I'll, all I'll say is it's going to be vampire it's gonna I'm, i want to do a vampire mm. book and i know that's very cliche and very cheesy i guess <laughs> but i'm i i will say i am really trying my best to not fall into tropes and it's going to be a very different kind of vampire book it's not going to be uh dracula in a in a victorian castle it's going to be more molecular and the lavender field. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> and uh, it'll be, it's not going to be a typical Victorian vampire, and I will not be doing Twilight vampires either. I'm going to mm -hmm. try to do something completely different, but everybody always says they're going to try to do something completely different. We but will that's, see. yeah, that's what I'm going to, that's my next, uh, well, that's my next plan. Well, the good part for us is we'll get to find out. Yes. Because um, whenever you're done, and we expect that in, uh, what, two more months? Or yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. This I expect uh, to be longer, for right. sure. It will, take, it will take a little while. But we look forward to having you back, Derek, as soon as that is, you know, as soon as we have another good reason I, to. I can't wait to be back. Yeah, it's been, absolutely. It's been really fun talking to you today yeah. and, uh, and in general. Um, he is Derek Mola. He is an, a published author with his second book out, The Lavender Fields. Uh, you'll be able to get this on Amazon, I assume, yes, in other uh, ways. Amazon for uh, print and ebook. Yes. All right. So look for that. Um, this is Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan. We appreciate Derek's time, as always. We appreciate yours as well. Thanks so much for being here. We'll see you next time. CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.